This is Andy Papari Ace with Podcast. Be careful about avoiding sidetracks. Don't go down them. There's always things you'd like to say and things you'd like to talk about, but they're not central to your topic, and you've got to be brutal about not saying them. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Lance Leventhal wrote 25 computer books spanning 1978 through 1992. His books include 6502 Assembly Language Programming, 6502 Assembly Language Subroutines, Z80 Assembly Language Programming, Z80 Assembly Language Subroutines, 6800 Assembly Language Programming, 6809 Assembly Language Programming, and Why Do You Need a Personal Computer? This interview took place on August 25th, 2017. Well, I did my graduate work at UC San Diego, and I had had a couple of Fortran programming classes as an undergraduate at Washington University in St. Louis and done a little programming elsewhere. So I, you know, I had an idea what was going on, but no idea that com- computer science wasn't a recognized topic in those days. What was your graduate work in? It, originally, I came in physics. Okay. I lasted there one year before they decided I wasn't going to be a physicist. <laughs> Actually, what I wanted to do was take the computer classes, and they had a very good setup. They they had officially as their policy, you could take whatever classes you wanted. So I said, I'll take the computer classes. They said, you can't do that. I said, yeah, but you said you, that you could take whatever classes you wanted. They said, yes, but everybody wants to take these classes. So it reminded <laughs> me of communist voting where you can vote for whatever party you want, but there's only one on the ballot. Right, right. (laughs) So I took my first computer class from, actually from Erwin Jacobs, the founder of Qualcomm. Oh, wow. All right. That was, you know, the first time I'd really seen that kind of thing. Finally got my degree after quite a few years, and uh, the most interesting thing I saw going on was microprocessors. So I did a worked on a little seminar that we had locally at IEEE, and then I decided I'd this is a good area to to develop some classes. I had taught, I'd been a teaching assistant for computer science while I was an under while I was a graduate student. I was in fact their chief victim because I was dumb and would work without being paid. So I was an ideal person for them to <laughs> ask whenever they needed another graduate student to take up some class that they had no idea what it was going to contain, and students had no idea what it was going to contain, and then they got exams on this material that they had no idea what it was going to cover. I remember one in particular where the students were up in arms. They'd, they'd had the midterm exam, and the and out of 40 points, the average grade was one. <laughs> and the mode was zero. The most frequent cost was they didn't get anything at all. And I, I you know, they had me come in, and I had looked at the exam, and I thought, These questions can't be answered. There are no answers to many of these questions. It turned out the professor had no background whatsoever and had no idea what he was asking. So for some reason, the students, since this was a a new class that they decided was going to be a core class and was going to be required for all of them, uh, they were somewhat upset. I don't know why. So anyway, I went from that to looking at the subject and trying to develop some materials. I was teaching out at a community college, so I developed some classes there. And then, you know, I did some educational work with the American Society for Engineering Education and groups like that. What, kind, was, of, what kind of classes were you teaching? I was teaching classes on the 8080 and the 6800 and microprogramming and things like that. Mm-hmm. So how, how, uh, how, did you, how had you learned this stuff? I mean, you, had, you said you took like a fortune. I just plan. learned it by, by yeah. doing it. Yeah. There were no classes, there were no materials, there was nothing around, there was, you know, you just had to, you know, uh, we we had, uh, out at the college, we had bought a couple of the MITS Altairs, we had no idea what to do with them, but we had them, and we had paper tape, we had all kinds of old computers, ancient computers, we had a, a PDP-1, I didn't even know there was a PDP-1, but I guess there had to be if they eventually got to 8 and 16. <laughs> But there was a one, and we had one of them, although we were never able to get it to work. So we had the computers, and we had the, you know, if you, the Mitz Altair came with a marvelous 
256 bytes of memory. That's bytes, not kilobytes or megabytes or anything or gigabytes yeah. or anything like that. That's 256 bytes. And you loaded it with panel switches on the front because that was the only way to load it. It didn't have any other thing to do. So you loaded the stuff into the memory with the panel switches. And then later on, we had paper, you know, paper tape and a wonderful teletype that broke down all the time. So we had marvelous facilities, but that's what everybody had. You know, there was mm -hmm. no, some of the fancier people had some fancy Intel gear, but in fact, that was one of the big reasons why IBM kept with the Intel processors. For an early project, they had bought some of this Intel gear, which was very expensive. And once they'd bought it, they didn't want to change. <laughs> Hence, Intel became the big success. And other other processor companies suffered because, of course, IBM used the Intel processors in their computers. So we worked, you know, I had some other people helping me and the cooperation, fortunately, of the department out at Grossmont College, which had which figured that it must be good, but they had no idea what it was. We also did some classes for teachers. We had some Radio Shack computers. We did, we did the world's, you know, among the first classes for, for high school and below. <laughs> there we had some cooperation from a district down in Chula Vista, and we were able to do, you know, get some people, and, and they required them to come, and it was a Saturday. So they were really thrilled. We had the most, you know, <laughs> a tremendously enthusiastic class. I couldn't wait to get out of there. But it, that was an interesting experience, and I was working on that and doing some other things that related to it. And an old friend of mine, Glenn Langdon, invited me to give a talk in Fort Collins, Colorado, at some kind of conference he was putting together. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll go to Fort Collins. So I drove from San Diego to Fort Collins. And, you know, it was, wasn't a very big conference, not a very big place. But it turned out one of the people there was a fellow named Adam Osborne. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we all remember Adam as for his Osborne One computer. Sure. At that time, he was a publisher and was, and was doing books, mostly his own, which were an introduction to microcomputers. As you look back on it, it was a perfectly terrible book that had all <laughs> kinds of engineering details about them that no one knew, needed to know. Adam, it turned out, was a chemical engineer. He had gotten his degrees from... University of Delaware, you know, the old DuPont place. Mm -hmm. So so he got up and said, does anybody have, you know, I, I'm doing these books. Does anybody have any materials that could become a book? So I, you know, if you do, well, come talk to me. So I said, yeah, I have some materials that could become a book. They could become a book on assembly language programming. Mm -hmm. And I had them all organized for the classes. And he said, yeah, we'll, you know, we can do that. So that was how those books were born. I'd been working on a textbook, you know, more traditional textbook for Prentice Hall. And of course they weren't interested in the in the personal computer end of it or the you know, the microprocessor end. They were strictly interested in the textbook end of it. So while I was doing the textbook I also did these as the first assembly language programming book. And it turned out to be a big success. We you know, they sold a ton of them. And we did ones for the 8080 and the 6800 and the six, good old 6502. From, at that time, it was used in the PET and the Commodore 64 and mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. And so those books, that's how those books came to be. I had all these sample questions, things that I knew were used. You know, what I, what I focused on was doing things that I knew would be used in applications and kind of building building a systematic way to teach people how to do this kind of thing. I'd done a lot of programming, so I knew sort of what, what the right tasks were. And and I had a basic philosophy that, you know, whatever you didn't have to say at a particular point, don't say it. <laughs> try to keep it as simple as possible and try to keep it, you know, oriented toward what you really needed to know and figure that uh, people would pick up the rest on their own or they discover it on their own. And I had done classes on this and discovered this, you know, this method worked very well. And one had to be pretty, pretty careful about avoiding sidetracks. Don't go down them. There's always things you'd like to say and things you'd like to talk about, but they're not central to your topic, and you've got to be brutal about not saying them. 
so I did those books and a bunch of lab books for Prentice Hall that were just, you know, really, you could sit and do it on your own. Even in the cl- even classes I taught, basically I stood, I sat up at the front, and if anybody had any questions, they came up. Otherwise, they just worked on their computers. And occasionally they'd come up and say they'd discovered a better way of doing things. And I looked at it and said, oh, yes, you definitely discovered it. But it was normally something that I knew perfectly well would work, but mm-hmm. I didn't want to have to explain it at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather take the simpler way. So those books worked out very well, and I think they're, they were lots of fun to do. You know, we we worked on them and tried to get, you know, things to work and had no idea what the heck we were doing or what, what might be useful and things like that. It was just basically, you know, based on a very tiny amount of experience. And, of course, the things themselves were very, very primitive. I mean, they weren't. They weren't well thought out or anything. They were mostly, you know, the the old 8080 was a thing that, basically a thing that somebody had come to them and said, here's what we want. Mm-hmm. They had taken a, a, deck, a deck PDP-8 and cut down the instruction set to what they thought could be on one chip. And they said, here's what we want. And there weren't any, you know, real architects involved who said, this is what you should have. So the 8080, it's the 8808, the original one, and the 8080 were kind of, you know, things where you had to say, well, this is the way it works. Why it works this way, no one really knows, but except for the guys who propose that architecture, and <laughs> they've got a long since been out of business. But this is what we have. And, of course, Intel was strictly a chip maker. They had no computer architects or anything like that on staff. So the things, you know, and the, the others were about the same. Motorola took, again, the, the deck the deck architecture and just cut it down to what they thought could go on one chip. It was a somewhat more logical thing than the Intel one, but still not, you know, not exactly, didn't exactly make any sense. And no one had any idea what you could do with these things. That idea was just way in the future. The question, I remember when the first computer store opened, it was on Santa Monica Boulevard in Los Angeles. It was a big deal. It was a tiny little store. And the idea was, who in the world would buy a computer? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was sort of like saying, you know, you're going to go down, I'm going to go down and buy me a rocket ship or or a satellite or something like that. It was just fascinating. The news media, they had people there all the time trying to figure out, what in the world would somebody actually buy one of these things for? And, of course, it turned out a lot of people would buy them. (laughs) <laughs> I remember giving talks and trying to explain to people why you would want one. And the you know the question was, what in the world would I want as a person? What in the world would I want a computer for? What in the world could you do with such a thing? Sort of like saying, gee, I you know here I could have my own nuclear reactor in the backyard, but why would I want one? <laughs> and of course, the applications, you know, there was no software. So, you know, first of all, explain to people what the heck software was, and then what would it do for you? And, you know, gradually the first applications developed, and they actually, you know, had some value, although they were, by today's standards, extremely primitive. (laughs) You know, the word processors and the spreadsheets and the databases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was still a question of, on all levels of what in the world would you do with this thing? Yes, we can have a computer on a chip. That's very nice, but why? You could do lots of things on a chip. But but people obviously, I mean, wanted to do things. They bought your book, uh, your 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 many books. Yeah, we uh, we sold over a million copies of those books. Wow, total or? Uh, yeah, total. Yeah, all right. So it seemed like you had so, you two- know by. I mean, even by today's standards, that's a good that's a good number of books. Absolutely. By those stand by the standards back then, it was just incredible, and they ended up, you know, uh, arranging for more books than anybody ever wanted, <laughs> <laughs> and they had a big bust of of books that they, you know, found that they had more books than people would buy. So, you know, it was a it was a big boom and bust kind of cycle. Yeah. But Adam was quite successful with that. Uh, I guess he, it wasn't big enough for him, so he decided to go in the computer business on his own, and he was very successful for a while with the Osborne One, but sure. then 
in the in the process of you know when the IBM PC came out, it suddenly just dominated everybody's attention. Sure. So did uh, it? Looking back, it's it's not clear why they didn't know any more than anybody else. And the the main guy who was involved got died in an airplane accident, the airplane crash. So we never know what he would have thought of. But somehow it just sort of it just dominated the thing. It was left with the competitors were left with being Apple and and IBM, and IBM clearly had the upper hand there. Sure, just much more money and much more support. Even though this was not something IBM really meant to do, or and it was sort of in a sense cannibalistic. It was in the end it destroyed the market for many of their low end computers, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is I'm sure not what they meant. Mm-hmm. But once that happened, the uh, the other computers could no longer sell. So the early the early machines like the Radio Shack TRS-80 or Trash-80, as people called it, uh, kind of died off. And yeah. Osborne Osborne tried to make a computer that was competitive with IBM, and so did Radio Shack. But people wanted the real IBM one, and the the competitors died out. And sure. Adam no. eventually went out of business. No one ever got fired for buying IBM, right? The, uh, yeah, that was true in those days. Yeah. It's amazing that now IBM is not a, you know, is is just sort of a secondary company and certainly you know, Intel and Microsoft or the and Google and play and Facebook and people like that are leaders and IBM is a is a follower. So, getting back to your books, you said you sold more than a million copies. Um did I assume you were getting royalties on that? Did did you uh yeah, it was actually, it was really strange because no one knew what they were doing, and they paid me royalties monthly. Hmm. Nobody nice. does that. No, I mean it's hard enough for them to pay royalties like they do maybe twice a year. But Adam had no idea what he was doing, so he was paying me monthly. <laughs> <laughs> it was very interesting because you'd open the the envelope, you have no idea what was in it. Can you imagine that in the paycheck business? You you open your envelope and there's no, you have no idea what, what he sold. Huh. So, you know, it, it was kinda of hard to make you know the budget or anything since you had no idea what he was what what was gonna happen. Did you get I mean, did you just get a check or were you getting statements that said you sold, you know Yeah, you got statements yeah, yeah. but you know, but you had no idea what they were gonna be and they varied tremendously. Sure. Some months they'd be thousands, some months they'd be hundreds, you know. <laughs> Just depend on how many he'd sold that month. Sure. And it went into translation all over the world. I've still got copies of them, I think, in Bulgaria, and then they were in Japanese, and they were all over. I did some books, in fact, for McGraw-Hill in Japan that never never did well in the U.S., but did very well over in Japan. Hmm. Wow. And there was, That's... you know, there were the usual things. There were, the books were, of course, sold in India. In India, they... They never have any idea what they're going to, you know, they supposedly take a license from you of some sort and they pay you something, but whether what they pay you is what they should have paid you is something no one's going to go to India and discover. Right, there's no way of knowing. So did you... No way of knowing, and, you know, there's various Taiwanese, uh, you know, copies of the books with lots of errors in them. Uh, Those you sometimes get royalties for and sometimes don't. But I still, you know, even even now, I'll still, still occasionally have somebody who'll come up to me and look at my badge and say something like, in fact, one guy said, and he was in his 40s, he said, my father used your book in his classes. Wow. I thought, your father? <laughs> I mean, the guy's in his 40s, so his father must be in his 60s to 70s. <laughs> How long ago was he taking his classes? <laughs> Of course, my favorite guy of all time was one who came up to me and staring at my badge and staring at my badge and finally said, I thought you were dead. Oh, nice. (laughs) I thought, well, you know, if I was, I would have stayed home because uh, this is really not a very interesting conference that I've come to. (laughs) But I've still got friends that I see every once in a while who use my books back in the early 80s and late 70s, and they still remember them. You, so, your books I'm mean, certainly taught hundreds of thousands of people uh, programming. That must be feel like a great accomplishment. Yeah, and it was. I think I think it was. You know, the books were pretty good, 
and we had a good time. You know, we really were very, I really was very systematic about trying to do a good job on them. Mm -hmm. Tried to really check them and make sure there were, whatever it was, there were vir virtually no errors. Occasionally there were things like, I think one Prentice Hall book, they, I was talking about a shift instruction and they left out the F. <laughs> Nice. I thought, well, that's a good instruction for a computer to have. I'm not sure exactly what it would do. <laughs> right. but not, too, not too different from halt you know, and catch was, fire, right? Yeah, you know, there were occasional bizarre problems like that, but I think there were very few problems, and the books have lived. You know, I look back at them. I've got copies all over the place, and they hold up remarkably well. Of course, you know, many of the things of doing machine language and assembly language are long gone. The, the applications are way, way too large. And so, you know, the number of people who program at that level is very small. And it's it kind of disappoints my kids because, of course, they want, they, they always wanted to ask me what was, you know, how do you use things like Microsoft Word? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't work at that level. I work at the level of <laughs> making the, the lower level of making these darn things work at all. I have no idea about any of this fancy software. Sure. Did, so did you... When well, you were... I was generally useless to them, which was very disappointing. <laughs> so when you were churning out all these all these books, I think you wrote like 25 books, basically? In, in... Yeah, I wrote about 25 books. Yeah. So when you were really into it and churning them out, did you... Was this as a sideline, or did you you know quit your day job of teaching, or, or were you... I never really had a day job. Okay. Not from the time I I left my last day job when when I left the link a bit so I didn't really have a day job I was just writing and doing some consulting and you know picking up uh, doing some classes for the military and classes for you know all kinds of people who wanted classes mm -hmm. there was no way to make a living it turned out you lasted a little while and you got to see all kinds of places you never particularly wanted to see I remember one group that they told me I was going to handle the the West Coast for them, which sounded logical. And the first one they gave me was Newport, Rhode Island. And That's I not thought, West Coast. <laughs> I, I thought, you know, there is an ocean here, but this does not appear to be the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> then they gave me one in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I got the impression I was getting, you know, not getting the high-class ones like London and Paris. I asked one of the people, and he said, well, our better teams get the better opportunities. I thought, that's nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm glad I'm appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting. You know, I did saw a lot of places I would never have seen otherwise. Spent a week in Richmond, Kentucky. I didn't even know there was a Richmond, Kentucky. I thought Richmond was in Virginia. Right. <laughs> but it turns out there is a Richmond, Kentucky, and Eastern Kentucky University is there. And they were very nice. And I taught of, taught for... University of Nebraska and Florida Tech and the New Jersey Institute of Technology, teaching in wonderful downtown Newark, which looked like a slum that was waiting for a city to attach itself to. Uh, all kinds of places. So you know, I sort of made a living, and the books were the books were the major thing that I was doing. Mm -hmm. Cool. So it looks like, at least for kind of the era that I'm looking at, you wrote 6502 Assembly Language Programming, and then you wrote 6502 Assembly Language Subroutines. And then you did the same series of two for Z80 and the same series of two for 6800. And uh, so, I mean, were these basically, did you feel they were the same book, but you changed the opcodes or you know whatever specific to, to those chips? No, they had different intentions. Mm -hmm. the, the 6502... Assembly language programming books were teaching books. That is, they were books where you could learn the learn the subject. The assembly language subroutine books were just for reference. They just contained a lot of useful subroutines you could look at and see what you know how to do those things. They weren't te they weren't teaching books, right? So they were different kinds of books, and they they you know the obviously the the subroutine books came later when there were more people who just who didn't want to. We didn't need to learn the thing, but just wanted to look up a, a particular routine and be able to just see it and be sure that it worked and they could put it in. It was kind of a library. 
So those were two different approaches to the to what is in some ways the same problem, but mm-hmm. the difference between learning and using it. There actually became a lot of people who were really using these things and putting them in applications, and suddenly there were, you know, Intel became a huge company. When I started, Intel was a tiny company. They didn't even have an office in San Diego. They worked through a rep. And I'll bet that rep must have made a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, Intel was like many companies which don't have offices in particular cities. They only work through reps if they're, you know, they have maybe a few offices around. And nobody ever heard of Intel. What the heck was it? You mentioned Intel and people, you know, people just didn't even respond. Obviously, the companies like Motorola, which, of course, at one time in its history made television sets, was a much better known name. Yeah, yeah. Most of the others were also pretty unknown like of course apple was a completely new company with the two steves and and commodore with chuck pedal and was new and most of the others you know there were companies all over the place god there were there were hundreds and hundreds of them i had so many darn computers i didn't know what to do with them all (laughs) i remember years later the my publisher prentice hall which had supplied me with some of these computers said that they had done an inventory and they discovered that I had some of their computers. This was maybe in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And they said, among other things, you have, of ours, a VIC, a Commodore VIC, and a TI-99-4. Please return them to us. So I, you know, I thought, geez, I mean, I mean these things are gather- back in, down my basement gathering dust. <laughs> Who the heck even remembers them? So I shipped them off to them. I mean, the Vic, I think, cost me more to ship than it did to buy. And so I shipped it off to them, and, and they had they had come to me, meanwhile, with a list of the other things that I had, which included a, an Atari, of course, and, and a... And a Coleco. Oh, a Coleco Atom, which I had one of those. Sure. And, a, and of course, an IBM uh, PC Junior. I had one of those, too. And they, they had all these all on my list, on the list of things that I was going to have to find in my basement and send back <laughs> to them. After they got the first two, they sent me a note saying, uh, please don't return any more of these to us. <laughs> <laughs> they probably had no idea. They probably had no idea what they were what we requesting. Would do with them. Since they were absolutely ancient. <laughs> That's crazy. I don't, think, I don't think very many people remember the Coleco Atom. Uh, listeners to this interview probably do, but... <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that's a... You know, there were all kinds of companies like Southwest Technical Products and Ohio Scientific and... Oh. It turned out my high school advisor became a big name in the business, uh, Jerry Purnell did the column and bite for many years and he had suppliers i don't know where he got them but jerry was had the ability to come up with all kinds of suppliers for things i still like the guy he got me to to go get a board from him he was he told me where to get it you you drove down the street at the oakland airport you found this unmarked building you went to the fourth door it was completely unmarked it was locked and you knocked on the door it was like the old speakeasy days and sure enough the guy came out and and he had the board i wanted and i paid him for it and took it i don't know how he ever did any business there was no marking on the building much less on his door and it was locked <laughs> it was an amazing you know it was amazing times the usual you know infant times i still remember one time at the west coast computer fair i'm looking at this board and it's a very nice board i thought you know i'd, I'd like one of those and they said, oh, you know, the guy who built, who designed that board is here. And I thought, well, I'll meet him. They said, oh, he's, you know, they pulled up the, the, the drape on the table, and the guy is lying underneath the table. I don't know what he'd been, you know, let's say, let's say I do not know what he had been ingesting, but it wasn't <laughs> something that was good for him. Mm-hmm. And he was definitely not in shape to talk to me. <laughs> I might have been pulled up the table when this guy is lying there under the table. It didn't inspire a lot of confidence. No, I can see that. And you... I remember the early, the early 
Osborne books had these funny looking Aztec figures on the cover. Later they went to a more prosaic cover. Mm-hmm. But the initial ones had this, you know, odd looking blue and yellow and green and figure that looked like an Aztec god or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I remember I had that. No idea where they came from. So when I was up there one time in Berkeley, I wanted to, you know, I figured I'd stop by at that Osborne Associates as it was then. They said, let's us introduce you to the guy who does our covers. So they took me down. They opened the door for this guy's office. The smell of marijuana smoke is just overpowering. I mean, this guy comes out, and I would say, well, you know, to say he was high was, I, I don't think he had been not high in quite a long time. <laughs> and I think that what the what was on the cover of that, of those books was probably what he saw in normal life. Because <laughs> he was really gone. <laughs> you know, it was funny because around, of course, it was the days when the East Coast people were very conservative and the Berkeley people were not at all. Right, right. You'd have, you'd have conferences where the East, you know, you could always tell an East Coast guy because he'd be wearing a suit and tie. And then there'd come by a Berkeley guy who looks like he's wearing the the shower curtain that he took down from his hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> so it was certainly a variety, a variety of people, many of whom had all kinds of issues. I sometimes think the reason why Bill Gates did so well was he was the only fully sane one in the mm. business. <laughs> Everybody else had, you know, serious psychological or, or addiction problems of one sort or another, whether it was alcohol or drugs or or whatever it was. Why do you they, think that is? Do you, do you have an opinion on that? I think it was just the times, and particularly the fact that a lot of it was West Coast, and the West Coasters were, you know, that was the that was the era of, of you know, drugs everywhere. I was in San Francisco the summer where they were, you know, the the merry pranksters were handing out LSD in the streets. It was not illegal at the time. Timothy Leary was experimenting on it at Harvard. Yeah, yeah. Until he got kicked out. But it was, you know, a time when a lot of people were into a lot of things. I went to a lot of parties and things where, you know, they were taking, including parties from a, from medical schools. Where you think they would know better, but boy, they really, <laughs> they really took in the stuff. And I thought, mm, I don't know if. if I were a doctor, I don't think I'd be ingesting what you're taking right at the moment, since no one has any idea what the effects of it are. <laughs> but it was that kind of time, and I think that it just, you know, Bill Gates, in a sense, was one of the few people who didn't do any of those things. And so, you know, he he went out and he got professional management, and he, you know, he got what a guy from... Our people from Harvard Business School and stuff like that to really run these companies. Most of the guys were had no idea how to run anything. So you had all these, these computers. Dogs. You had all these uh, uh, access to all these machines. Some of which <laughs> apparently belonged to your publisher. Uh, did did you have a did you have a favorite? Did you have an, an opinion about you know which which one if you would go to if you actually needed the, to use a computer? Uh, I always liked it. I always liked the Trash 80. It was my f- first real computer, and so I I had a warm feeling for it. It was terrible, but I don't know. You know, the ones that you actually would want to use, I think uh, probably the ones from Chromemco and people like that were probably the best built ones. There was nothing special about the Apple. The Apple II was terrible, but but very successful. I think it. You know, there were there weren't any that struck me as being, boy, I just really loved that one. I liked them all. I thought they were all kind of nice and mm-hmm. interesting. They did different things. The difference came down to the fact that the more business oriented people like the IBM machines, and the more graphics and creative people preferred the Apple machines. I'm not a very graphical person, so the Apple machines kind of. You know, yeah, I thought that was a great idea for those who liked it, but it wasn't it wasn't really for me. Sure. I mean all the things they said, why would you want to do C greater than? Well, you know, I'd been in computers for a long time and so 
see greater than seemed normal to me. <laughs> I understood that it wasn't normal to other people. <laughs> and Apple certainly had a great idea, but for me, I, I didn't care. I, I mean, I'd run teletypes and run paper tape through machines, and I was sort of used to it. But for people who weren't used to that, it was kind of a terrible way of dealing with a machine. <laughs> didn't make any sense at all. It's, it's, it was always hard to explain to people why, you know, why machines, they work the way they did. I said, there isn't anything necessary about it. We could make much better machines, but most of the people who are building them are, are used to this, so they think it's normal. And then finally people came along with the, you know, the the people from Xerox Park came along with a much better, you know, the graphical user interface, which was much better than uh, anything we'd ever seen before on a computer. Made a lot of sense, but it took a time when there was a reasonable market for that. But certainly it was the more sensible approach the, to the old CPM approach of you know, the machine comes up and says, C greater than. Well, what are you going to do with that? And how are you going to explain it to people? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And particularly for the teachers and folks like that who had no, you know, no skills at all in the computer world, explaining to them how to run these machines that didn't run very well and and had this terrible interface was very difficult. The the Apple machines were much better suited to them, but it wasn't, you know, early early of course the people had no idea. Microsoft Basic was considered really sophisticated stuff. But it was fascinating times, and you know the the early history is a interesting business. And I think there was an article in Computer Magazine not long ago about how it happened and why certain machines succeeded and certain others didn't. There certainly was virtually no difference among the chips. Sure, the chips themselves were all all had about the same capabilities. They were the same technology, and none of them were architecturally wonderful. They were all various forms of, you know, here's what we could do, or here's what we found in a book, or here's what we found on the computer that we had that that we used as a base for this. But, of course, it turned out that Intel won out and everybody else lost. I think they had the advantage. They had the advantage that they were very, very strong technically. They had really, really good people at the top making mm-hmm. chips. Yeah. They were the best at making chips. And I think in the end, uh, the rest of it, uh, yeah, they you know, they they had to do all the rest of those things, but the making of the chips and the dedication to it and the fact that was really their product. So they weren't making money a lot of other places, companies like Motorola and, and all the others that were around were, this was just one of their lines. They had hundreds of lines, and this was just one of them. And while they were interested in it, they, they didn't have the dedication. Intel really only made memory and microprocessors, mm-hmm. so they were much more dedicated to it. It's sort of like you know having a having a. I've never believed in people having a sideline to go back to if you're not successful in something like the you know show business. You got to be a hundred percent for it. If you're going to be a hundred, if you're less than a hundred percent, your chances of making it are not are not that great. Sure. You have a fallback position where you're going to be a dentist or something like that. You just can't do it. The guy who's desperate, who's going to either sink or swim with this, is going to beat you out, <laughs> very likely. Yeah, yeah. So that's just my feeling about it, was that yeah, Intel was there, and they had huge technical skills. This was before the real days of the Silicon Valley, when the things they did in San Jose was they packed fruit. Sure. You know, San Jose had always been the armpit of the, you know, all the people who had big money lived in San Francisco, people who didn't have big money or lived in Oakland, and then San Jose was just the, (laughs) it was just terrible. It was a grungy (laughs) old place, you know, kind of John Steinbeck world. And the Silicon Valley, you know, they they had fruit, you know, fruit orchards and things like that. That was that was what they did in Santa Clara. It was very heavily agricultural. Right, right. And there's, you know, when you look at it, you think, how did this become Silicon Valley? There's nothing special about it. It's certainly 
not a particularly nice place or anything like that. We hold a lot of conferences in Santa Clara, and I tell my people, you know, you have to explain to the folks outside that that no one wants to come to Santa Clara except nerds. There is nothing there. <laughs> I mean, there it isn't culturally wonderful. It isn't historically wonderful. It isn't, you know, any of the things that that you would think would make a place shine. You know, and there's no, there's no, uh, none of the old questions of having materials close by. You know, the reasons why the steel mills were in particular places or the car manufacturers were in particular places because their supplies, their supplies were there. But Silicon Valley, it clearly doesn't matter. But somehow that area succeeded and became the, you know, this huge center of the technical universe, even though you still go there and you think, this is not a particularly nice place. <laughs> it's not, you know, there's nothing, nothing wonderful about it. It's nothing that, you know, look, you look at it and say, boy, this is the place to be. But technically speaking, it sure is the place to be. Sure. And of course, it was before the days when of the tremendous prominence of Stanford as the university around which much of this was built. Because when I wanted to go to, you know, looking for a college, Stanford was not a first-class place. Kids from my high school went to Stanford were, you know, maybe in the top 50, but not in the top 10. It was just not considered at the level of a Harvard or a or an MIT or something like that. Whereas sure. now it's now it's probably the predominant, the most prominent technical university in the world. So it looks like you started writing uh, roughly 1978 with the 6502 assembly language programming book. And it looks like you stopped around 92 with Turbo C Quick Start, which is a just long time to be writing. Uh, why, why did you stop or did you stop? Looks like you stopped. Oh, I stopped because I just couldn't make any money anymore. Yeah. The the old books had died out and the new books were just didn't do very well. And I had been involved actually in I was really more interested in the textbook end of things and to some extent in the in the personal computer stuff. And I did more editorial work trying to put together book projects and we had a small publisher. But we never we never really made any ground. We did a lot of books. And some some very good books, but they just never really caught on. A couple of them yeah. did, did okay, but we weren't able to make a living out of it. We had some misadventures along the way, as everybody does. We we had a contract with IBM for books. We were going to be the the power, the force behind IBM books, hmm. and they had all these contracts, and they had all these people who were ready to write books and all this stuff. We did one book, one book. And that book came out the same week. It was about uh, an IBM uh, word processor. It came out the same week as the new edition, a uh, new edi- version of the word processor came out. So it didn't sell anything, and that died. And we did some textbooks with a company called Scott Forsman, but that was, I think, one book also <laughs> died. There are all kinds of ideas of doing books that. You know, real quality books that were written well and had silly things in them like indexes and stuff like that. But it turned out the market went elsewhere. And so it just kind of passed me by. Mm -hmm. What do you do today? Uh, Today we're involved in another thing that I'd done back in the old days was uh, we do a, a conference called Flash Memory Summit. So that's a pretty big conference. It gets about mm-hmm. 5,000 people. Oh, wow. And I've been in the conference business for about 40 years. I was also a technical editor for a magazine called Simulation, which of all things was originally the magazine of the analog computer people, a kind of computer that's long forgotten. Mm. And they also had the, you know, did the thing for the big simulations, the big simu- flight simulators and power plant simulators and stuff like that. So I was their technical editor for some years, and they their main asset was that they, since analog computers were kind of on the outs, <laughs> their main asset was that they had part of the national of the national computer conference, 
And so I got involved in that and in their conference summer computer simulation. And so I did that for some years. And then when I got out of the book business, I went back in the conference business and we've done a whole lot of shows, all very technical and mostly in the Silicon Valley, but involved in microelectronics in one way or another. Flash memory is one of them. Uh, we did one on Ethernet technology. We did one on open servers. We did one on advanced uh, TCA, which is a embedded spec, because I was involved in embedded computing as well, and some other shows like that. So that's primarily what I do nowadays. I've done some other work, uh, you know, some consulting and some work as an expert witness and work doing classes for the military. And we did. I was involved in a company that that did things for the NSA for many years. So I can now scare people by saying I work for the NSA, although what I did for them was mostly computer stuff. It had nothing to do with the spy, spy part of the business. I was actually working with NSA at the time when the first worm was developed. The first and it was done by the son of the of, of NSA's chief scientist. He's now a professor at Harvard. It was kind of a big deal that here's the first worm, and it got into all kinds of things. It was creating all kinds of havoc. And NSA discovered that the, the guy who did it was the son of their chief scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Are we talking so about... That, uh, that, went, along for a, that we, went along for a while, but unfortunately that company went under. We're we talking about the, the Morris worm? The internet worm? Yeah, the Morris worm. Robert yeah. Morris is yeah. Robert Morris is now a professor at Harvard, but the but his father was the chief scientist for NSA. <laughs> nice, very cool. Um, all right, I think this will be my last question. Um, so this this podcast is listened to by hobbyists who use Atari computers and Apple and and TRS eighty and that sort of thing. Um, if you could send those people a message. And you can right now. What would you tell them? Oh, I think it was a great part of our of computer history. I think you're a part of what what really became a tremendous, tremendous industry. Who could think, you know, that we've been through the time when suddenly companies like Intel and Microsoft became the hottest companies in the world, and now what is it? You know, now it's obviously the the Leadership has passed to companies like Google and Apple and uh, Facebook and things that no one could ever have imagined. I look back at the, you know, I was, my high school advisor was a science fiction writer, Jerry Purnell, and, and he had science fiction writers at his house all the time, but no one ever imagined anything like what really happened. I don't think there's any, you know, it's been a, a tremendous ride. Anybody who's had a part of it is certainly, I know, I know I've had a lot of fun with it. I tell my students I haven't made a lot of money, but certainly can't complain about having had a good time and enjoying it. And it was a great deal. It was lots of fun and lots of amazing things happened. And here we are at the, of an industry that's just come from nothing into you know, certainly Google is what the most valuable company in the Google and Apple are vying for being the most valuable company in the world and Amazon and things like that, that you could never have imagined whatever happened to old companies like Ford Motor and General Motors and the, the era when the generals ruled the world, General Motors and General this and General that. But, you know, in a sense, all the people who worked on the trash 80s and the, and the Apple twos and the things like that, they really did change the world. Yes, indeed. Sometimes you wonder if it's for the better, but we did, you know, <laughs> we certainly we certainly did change the world. Who can imagine a thing like Google? Even the, the name is so silly, and here you have this, you know, you go down the street in, Santa, in San Jose, and you see a sign that says, building for rent, or office for rent, or complex for rent. And you drive down, you see all of these, and you drive back. And the signs are gone. It says Google on them instead. <laughs> Google just, I think they just rent all these buildings. They think, figure they'll need them eventually, so they just take them when they're available. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who would have, who would have thought? I'm, I was driving down on the Bayshore Freeway just a little while back, and I'm passed by this bus. And I think, boy, they really have fancy. This is, it looks like the fanciest bus I ever saw in my life. 
And I realized it's a Google bus. Yeah. It's a special Google bus. Just get, get the employees to work, yeah. Yep. Uh, and you think, you know, if you ever see the Silicon Valley series, that's a wonderful series with those, you know, <laughs> getting a real example of <laughs> the crazy world of the valley and <laughs> what happens in it. <laughs> That's been a, I, I don't know how many people can appreciate it who don't go to the valley or don't have any idea what the valley is like, but that certainly has been a a real look into, <laughs> into the, you know, from the comic point of view of what goes on, and some of those guys are really, really good actors. Yeah. So That's... I think for everybody who's been in the business, it's, it's, you know, you've been part of an incredible ride. Just incredible when you think that, you know, what the start of it and, and it's gone through so many generations and companies have come and gone. IBM has gone from being a, you know, a huge force the, the tremendous force that they were in the seventies and eighties now to just kind of another company. And even Intel and Microsoft are sort of considered old line companies that are having a hard time breaking into new markets, which are being dominated by people like Google and Facebook and, and Amazon. And it seems like nobody can figure out how to keep going and keep your you know keep your products going and keep your innovation going at the same time. Yeah. Hmm. So there's no question. There's still tons of opportunities all over the place. So I think it's yeah, it's been a it's been a great ride. Well, great. Thank you so much, Lance. This is exactly what I was hoping for. Okay. Sure. Glad to do it. Thank you very much for asking me. If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute, there are two ways you can help. You can help fund these interviews directly by contributing to my Patreon. A small monthly contribution will help offset the expenses of making these oral history interviews. Contribute at patreon.com slash savits. Or make a tax-deductible contribution to the Internet Archive, a nonprofit digital library that has done incredible things to preserve computer history. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org slash donate. Thanks. <laughs>